I'm Ivana, and I'm not here to talk about my work. I'm here to talk about uh, about sports and how awesome I think they are, and hopefully you do too. Um, so I'm going to show you this. We have no context for this yet, but it's great, and I'm going to tell you why it's great because it's an awesome sports moment for a lot of reasons. Uh, here tonight, I'm here to talk to you about sports and data specifically. Um, and by sports data, I mean advanced analytics, advanced stats, advanced metrics, sabermetrics, like whatever you call it. The practice is just a term for analyzing sports empirically. Um, it got its start in baseball, but it's everywhere now. Uh, specific metrics just take the things we already track in sports, like goals or points scored, and using technology and analysis make them more meaningful. So again, stats as you know them are things like points scored and advanced stats take these specific numbers, combine them, and they impose the will of math onto sports. Um, and they give the game context, I think, and let us give objective answers to questions like this. So like, which player contributed most positively to their team's offense, or you know, how many touchdowns will they score next year? Um, they also let us evaluate things, or like evaluate past performance, or predict it. Uh, we can know which players to objectively love or hate, or whether or not we're over or underpaying them. They're also used to set things like Vegas odds uh, for betting. And we can get validation from it too. We can know who to love, who to hate, who is secretly amazing, or which player looks great but is like actually really terrible. Um, and you can prove other people like objectively wrong on, the, on, the, on Reddit, which is fabulous. Um, so, Let's start with some examples. It would be, it would be best. Uh, so I'm not really going to talk about calculation or anything here, but uh, that's a whole other series of talks. But we'll go with basketball um, first. It's not like baseball level specific, but it's starting to get really wonderfully pedantic on its own. Uh, they have player tracking uh, in, with a system called Sport View, which is like a camera system in the stadium rafters that follows the ball and every player on the court at all times. Uh, 25 times a second, it collects or it records in real time the X and Y position of the ball, or sorry, the X and Y position of the players and the X, Y, Z position of the ball. So this lets us do all sorts of cool stuff. Um, this is an example of an, of an advanced stat. It's called wind shares. Uh, and it started in baseball, and it's an attempt to give the individual credit for team success. So in the basketball example, there's 82 games in a basketball season. So how many wins out of that season, it's each player responsible for. Uh, as an example, the Chicago Bulls uh, in 95-96 had a historic season. They won 72 out of 82 games. Uh, they had Michael Jordan at the time, and they also had a guy named Ron Harper. Uh, which one of them was responsible for more wins? Um, probably Michael Jordan, but win shares will let us know for sure. Um, so in that season, we see that it was true according to the win share stat. Michael Jordan was responsible for 20 of those wins, and Ron only about six, unfortunately. Uh, but if you think about it, right, Michael Jordan probably played more minutes and was therefore responsible for more wins. Uh, Ron Harper only played about 20, Michael Jordan had 37 minutes a game. So, introducing win shares per 40 minutes played. So you can, you can have you, this is normalized for 48 minutes so that you can actually compare the two. So yes, we can see that empirically, objectively, uh, Michael Jordan was more valuable than Ron Harper, but, and I'm sure you really needed me to tell you that. But <laughs> another example, Cleveland Cavaliers, 2015-16, they won the NBA championship. Um, I see some Warriors, I'm sorry. Um, during the regular season, uh, LeBron James was responsible for 14 more. 14 of Cleveland's 57 wins. If you took those wins away, which is a little bit simplistic, but you know, they wouldn't have made the playoffs at all. Um, and in the playoffs, he was responsible for 4.7 wins, 0.7. Um, and that's without him, they don't win a championship, period. Um, and you can see that he actually was more productive for 48 minutes in the playoffs than he was in the regular season. So he was clearly just slacking. Um, but you can see who's great, but you can also see who's awful, which is also fun. Um, I feel bad, but this is uh, the Denver Nuggets point guard in the same season. He 
played so terribly that he essentially took away wins that his teammates had created. <laughs> um, Denver didn't make the playoffs, that's why I didn't share that. Um, another one in, from basketball, effective field goal percentage. This one, for context, a field goal is just a basket that's not a free throw. Uh, regular field goal percentage is just how many of them you make, which seems fine on its face, but if you think of it like, say, you and I, right, we both take 10 shots and make seven of them. And our field goal percentage is equal, it's 70%, right? But say out of those, I make four three-pointers and you only make one three-pointer out of them. My effective field goal percentage is 90, while yours is 75 still. Uh, this is because on my seven shots, I've scored 18 points. You've only scored 15. And I've contributed more on less shots and that should be reflected somehow. And this can tell us that you may have scored a lot of points, but you, maybe you wasted shots doing it. Um, and maybe I should get the ball a bit more than you. Um, and when you, when you combine all, like, all of these stats, they're amazing, right? So this is 538, um, a great site for sports analytics. And this is their Carmelo uh, sort of tool interactive thing, which identifies like similar players to, to you or to a player throughout NBA history and uses them to forecast. You can see what a current uh, NBA player's future might look like. So you can see up there, like, you know, a projection, you can see his five year market value. And it's crazy. It's really fun. But anyway, on to football. Uh, to a wonderful, this stat was a great name, defense adjusted value over average. Um, this breaks down every single play in an NFL football game, uh, its situation and the teams involved to try to give proper credit for scoring points and winning games. And it's a percentage. So basically in similar situations, how much better than, are you than other players at your position? So again, say we both play running back, right? And we both get the ball. It means you get the ball and you run. Um, <laughs> and say, say, we say we both run for, for three yards. We both gain three yards in football. Uh, but who made the more valuable run to the team? Uh, DVOA will help with that. So how much did that run help our team achieve the goal of getting to the end zone? So DVOA will look at stuff like where on the field you are, which down it was, and in similar situations, how did other running backs do? Um, so if on your three yard run, in similar situations, other running backs only made one yard. That's, you've, you've overperformed. But on my three yard run in the same situation, other people got six or seven. So I'm not really as helpful. So who's better now, right? Uh, so for quarterbacks, this is super important because you know, pay them a lot of money and they're responsible for a lot of wins. You're winning nothing with an average quarterback. Uh, and you can see here that in the 2015-16 season, Carson Palmer, was 34% better than average, and that's worth a lot of money in the NFL. And Brock Osweiler wasn't really very good. Um, however, the Houston Texans still saw fit during the offseason to give him a lot of money. Um, and then in the season following, um, <laughs> and they're, they're, very, they're very upset about having given him all that money. Um, but we'll move on from there uh, to baseball, which is the king of advanced stats. And its sort of tracking system is called StatCast. And it tracks every object and person on the, on the diamond with radar equipment and high-res cameras. And there, I'm going to start with launch angle, which is exactly what it sounds like. And it, at first, it isn't interesting. Uh, but uh, we can tell what kind of hitter a player is by something called average launch angle. Um, so does he hit lots of fly balls? Does he hit lots of grounders? Uh, we can use it to see if a player needs to fine tune their swing or their stance to hit the ball at a different angle. Uh, for pitchers, their average launch angle against can tell us if he pitches a lot of fly balls or grounders, home runs, and then players can use this to adapt to the pitcher. Uh, and pitchers can change how they approach a given hitter, throw differently. And here you can see you can pair it with something called exit velocity, which also is what it sounds like. Uh, to show which combinations of launch angle and exit velocity produce the most, what Nate Silver, I believe, calls um, scoring value. So that's fabulous. And I'm just going to rapid fire through a couple more here. So yeah, wins above replacement. If you took a player on a team and replaced him or her with league average player, how many wins would you lose? This is similar to win shares. Um, 
yeah, so yeah, wins above replacement. They're a player's total contribution to the team, basically. So this is in baseball, again. These are just some like average values, and you can see just how much like a most valuable player is worth. And it doesn't sound like much, but in like a long season, that's worth a lot of money to teams. <laughs> baseball, again, not just like runs created, but weighted runs created. So this player was worth X runs to the team after they control for ballpark. Like they control for ballpark, right? Which is like, because for example, in Boston, their ballpark has an enormously high wall on one side called the Green Monster. So a home run over that wall is worth objectively more than a home run over a wall yet high. Um, and that's what this helps us understand. And just a couple more, soccer, expected goals, <laughs> expected goals, because soccer is so low scoring, but there's lots of opportunities created in it. So you want to measure how well teams create and convert their opportunities. And just because a team creates lots of chances doesn't mean it creates good ones. Um, and you can sort of see what their expected goals scored minus their expected goals allowed. And you can see sort of how much better the team is. And soccer is still kind of in its infancy, but it's really kind of, it's starting to catch up. And finally, stuff for everybody, um, what they call the Pythagorean record. And this is how many games your team should have won in the last season based on the number of runs they scored and allowed. And this actually, if you compare this calculated Pythagorean record with their actual number of wins, you can, you can make an argument for how lucky a team was. So if your team had like a Pythagorean, Pythagorean record of 20 wins, but you actually got 24 wins, it means that you got away with a few or your team overperformed. But if you had 20 and your team only won 12, something went wrong there. Um, and there are arguments against it. Not everyone loves this. Uh, usually sort of old heads in, in sports. So here, I don't know if any... Oh. Could you guys hear that? Oh, damn. Oh, it's... Oh, crap. It's just a cramp to some people who were really smart made up to try to get in the game, but they had no talent. This is, okay, I'll, I'll try and just state myself. It was Charles Barkley, who's an NBA baseball player. He says, analytics don't work at all, they're crap. They're just some stuff that people who are really smart, oh crap, yeah, tried to, oh. Yeah, people who are really smart tried to get in the game because they have no talent. So, and they, they made it up. Um, that's what he says. Um, and, but usually people like him think that uh, we want advanced stats to replace the actual watching of the game. But that's not true. Like, they think that we want to take the romance out of it, but it's not true. Um, because, they, you know, People, people like him don't have trouble with numbers. They just have issues with numbers that kind of try to quantify that invisible thing. Uh, they're just tools, right? So they're not meant to replace the watching of the game, but just give it context. And I'd argue that they make the game a lot more interesting because we can dig even deeper into like into the sports that we love, figure out why our favorite players are even more awesome than we thought they were. Uh, we can talk more deeply about it, build discussions. We can win arguments on the internet. Um, <laughs> This is important. Um, and it's just a way of helping us find and evaluate talent more reliably and appreciate it more. And it doesn't make a brilliant play any less magical. I think it does the opposite. It makes it more magical. So this. What? All right. So that's Steph Curry of the Golden State Warriors. So. He makes three pointers, like and this is what advanced stats tell us. He makes three pointers just as well with a defender this far away as an average NBA shooter does with a defender over there. Um, like exact distances, like stats can tell us this. He actually shoots better than the NBA average as the clock winds down. So you can quantify how much better under pressure he is. Um, and one more. Um, the pull up three pointer uh, is like a type of shot, it's notoriously difficult. He, the rest of the NBA shoots at 28%. Regular three, they average 35. On the pull-up three, he averages 42%. So on the specific type of shot, like it can tell you how much better he is than NBA average and makes cool 
So, so who's ruining the magic now? What? Wait, this is coach. Advanced stats. They're cool. 